Namaskara and welcome to BIC Talks, a podcast by Bangalore International Center. And I think it is because the world was looking for a figure. The world was looking for a figure of compassion, for a figure of tolerance, a figure of love, a figure of brotherhood. And Buddha epitomized this. And, you know, he didn't believe in an organized church. There was no organized dogma associated with the Buddha. After all, Buddhism came much later. And Buddha became the Buddha by not following a Buddha. You know, yes. Buddha ultimately said, search for the light within you. That was parliamentarian and author Jairam Ramesh talking about why the poem The Light of Asia had the impact it has had on our collective imagination. This episode of BIC Talks is an extract of an earlier BIC stream session on Jairam's biography of the poem The Light of Asia and its poet Sir Edwin Arnold. Author and independent consultant Radhika Chadha was in conversation with Jairam. He also responds to audience questions towards the end. And now, over to Radhika. Thank you, Lekha, and thank you, Bangalore International Center, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be in conversation with Jairam Ramesh about his fascinating book. When I finished reading this book, what occurred to me immediately was this was a project of intense intellectual curiosity into a man who himself demonstrated intense intellectual curiosity, Sir Edwin Arnold. And uh, as Jairam puts it in the book, this is a biography of a poem and a biography of the poet. And, you know, in your, in your exploration, Jairam, you've reached far and wide. You know, you've, you've reached across time and place into the most unexpected nooks and crannies of the world uh, to even look into the minds of great thinkers. And uh, it's really fascinating when you consider that they were statesmen, politicians, religious men and women, poets, writers, thinkers, scientists, who all at some point have been influenced by this poem, which you have detailed in the book. And think these are thinkers who shaped the world as we know it now. And one could argue that they shaped us, they shaped, you know, how the way we think. And I think this is what really fascinated me about your book. But beyond this, I thought that there was also a whole lot of interesting themes to be explored, you know, the power of an idea, the power of a story. And I hope in the course of the next hour, we'll get to discuss some of that. Sure. So um, let's begin with perhaps you could tell us all about the poem, Light of Asia, and about the poet whom you have investigated in such such depth. Well, the Light of Asia was uh, 1879 epic poem on the life of the Buddha. It's not about Buddhism or Buddhist philosophy, but it's a description, a poetic description of his life. Uh, Almost 50,000 lines, eight books, and published in London for the first time in 1879. Quickly, it became a sensation in America. It spread to Europe, and very quickly, it came to India. It got translated into 13 European languages. It got translated into something like seven or eight East Asian and North Asian languages and got translated into about 12 South Asian languages. And as you say in your introduction, it had an extraordinary impact, a literary impact, cultural impact, political impact, social impact. And I think the reason why the book became a sensation, apart from Edwin Arnold, whom I will talk about a little while, the reason why the book became such a sensation, Radhika, was because it dealt with the humanity of Buddha. It didn't deal with the divinity of Buddha. You know, divinity divides, humanity unites. And it is because of the humanity of Buddha that Arnold brought out in such beautiful poetry that this book became the phenomenon that it became. Now, Edwin Arnold was an Orientalist. He was a Victorian. He was a believer in British rule. He would have been very happy that the statue of Queen Victoria still you know, stands in, in, in Bengaluru. He was a great believer in Britain's manifest destiny. But he was also a translator of the Hitopadesha. He was a translator of the Mahabharata. He was a translator of the Gita Govinda. And most importantly, 
he was a translator of the Bhagavad Gita uh, into the song Celestial, which became uh, one of Mahatma Gandhi's favorite abiding texts. So, you know, it's a two-in-one biography, biography of a poem, biography of an author, and a description, a historical description of why this poem went on to have the impact that it had. And I think it is because the world was looking for a figure. The world was looking for a figure of compassion, for a figure of tolerance, a figure of love, a figure of brotherhood. And Buddha epitomized this. And, you know, he didn't believe in an organized church. There was no organized dogma associated with the Buddha. After all, Buddhism came much later. And Buddha became the Buddha by not following a Buddha. You know, yes. Buddha ultimately said, search for the light within you. And I think that's what appealed across the world. You know, Indians, Americans, Europeans. You know, when I first read uh, John Key's India Discovered, it was a revelation to me that so many of the facts that I took for granted in my history books taught to us in school uh, had been only recently discovered. You know, uh, much of what we now know of India's history you know, was not widely known till the end of the what, 18th century. And these were Englishmen, mostly amateur historians or amateur archaeologists, etc., who rediscovered India for us, not just for the world, but for Indians themselves. And John Key has this very nice affectionate way of putting it. He says it was a unique salute by a conquering power to a nobler, more enduring civilization. But as you also point out in the book, Orientals later got bad rep, right? I mean, you have Edward Said being critical of them. And I found it really fascinating because you hear John Key covered Cunningham, he covered Jones, he covered Princip, but there was no mention of Edwin Arnold in his book. Yeah. And was that because he was not seen as an original thinker? He was a popularizer? Yes, he was a popularizer. He was not a scholar like Max Muller was. He was not a scholar like James Princip was. He was not an archaeologist like Alexander Cunningham was. But he fused together. Uh, you know, the writings, the translations, the archaeological evidence, the historical evidence that was coming up uh, to produce this literary sensation. And he became more popular and more known than any scholar. You know, uh, Radhika, I, Shashi Tharoor, and I have very good friends, we are colleagues, but I differ with him. You know, I, I think there were certain aspects of uh, the British rule in India that we cannot be wished away. You know, there was a discovery of India's civilizational past, uh, you know, whether it was the British rediscovery of Hinduism, certainly the British discovery of Buddhism and Buddhist legacy, of course, aided by a large number of Indian scholars across uh, the subcontinent. Uh, by Indian, I mean also Sri Lankan, also Tibetan, uh, Nepalese, people from different parts of the subcontinent. So they, they, were, they were Orientalists. Then, of course, and Orientalism has now got a very bad name. But I don't believe that William Jones or Max Muller uh, or Edwin Arnold or even Alexander Cunningham ever sat down and said, now, how do I justify British rule in India? Should I translate a book from Sanskrit to justify British rule in India? You know, that proposition doesn't appeal to me. There was genuine curiosity on the part of this generation. Some of them became great archaeologists. Some of them great, became great epigraphists, and some of them were poets like Edwin Arnold. But the net result of it was, after such a long gap, India and Indians began rediscovering and get, taking pride in their own legacy, in their own civilizational legacy. Buddha had fallen off the map. Nobody, even uh, Ashoka had fallen off the map, you know, till, you know, in the early part of the 20th century. Ashoka got discovered. Uh, the Mauryan Empire got you know, discovered through the, the Arthashastra, which first came into the public domain in the year 1904, the year Edwin Arnold passed away. I see some of these people as scholars. I see some of these people, of course, uh, you know, they believed in British rule in India. After Edwin Arnold wrote a two-volume biography of Lord Dalhousie, the greatest imperialist. Uh, other than Curzon, if you were to name one viceroy who was an imperialist, it was uh, Lord Dalhousie. Uh, but then, how do you explain his translations of the Hitopadesha, Geet Govinda, Mahabharata, and of course, the Bhagavad Gita as well? So I think these were people who had genuine curiosity. 
Edwin Arnold was principal of the Pune College that later became the Deccan College. You know, he knew Marathi, uh, he knew Sanskrit certainly. Of course, he knew Persian, Arabic, Turkish. He was a polyglot, and he was able for this poem. I'll give you one very simple example of how we lost our knowledge, Radhika. He had some sources which were based on French books, which were translations. from the, the chinese, chinese. Mm. not from San- the sanskrit version has been lost you know it's a there's a sort of recursive nature in which knowledge was gained and knowledge was lost yes. and which which again brings me back to the point that while you say that he was an orientalist in his own time that's a title which sort of i was given or taken away from him you have a quote in your book that by ross i think who said that you know he escaped being an orientalist <laughs> uh, there were journalists who sort of didn't want to accord him the respect of a scholar so it's uh, it seems to me that we are looking back in hindsight and recognizing a lot of his achievements but while he was present in his own time the book was a success but he did not get the kind of scholarly so he, respect he that he didn't get the recognition because the scholars thought of him as a journalist and the journalists thought he was a poet and the poets never took him very seriously you know yeah, uh, he, said, <laughs> he desperately wanted to be poet laureate queen victoria Uh, wanted him to be poet laureate but the british establishment thought he was too much into oriental literature that you know he was translating all the sanskrit persian uh, and arabic stuff and he was not writing enough english poetry original english poetry and that's the reason why he didn't become the poet laureate so yeah i mean you know he was a he, he married three times his third wife was japanese and he became a great uh, fan uh, and devotee of japanese culture in in the later part of his life as he was of the indian civilization and indian culture in the early part of his life in the middle part of his life uh, but remember you know this was a late victorian period science we are seeing an efflorescence of science we are seeing the growth of religious doubt we are seeing the disenchantment with the organized church we are also seeing the gilded the age of agnosticism was just starting yeah, you see yeah. the gilded age we are seeing prosperity and therefore we are seeing people uh, wanting you know a, a source of a solace people wanting to hold on to something uh, which gives them a meaning uh, to existence meaning to life to makes them understand the nature of life and buddha the personality of buddha filled that need he filled that need in the later part of the 19th century he certainly filled that need in the early part of the 20th century and he continues to fill that need thanks to uh, personalities like the dalai lama and so on so i think uh, the poem became popular because it was on a popular subject uh, you know it was on the buddha and also as you say there was something in the zeitgeist of the late 19th century which lent itself to this yes, it welcoming was, this this idea but of its time it wasn't without its own distractions wasn't it i mean he got a lot of flack from the christians He, they forced him to write light of the world yes. you know which so, never had the type of impact that you know uh, um, uh, the light of asia had and of course radhika i should also mention that the theosophical society played a very important role in the popularization of the light of asia including to mahatma gandhi because he he came across it through theosophy the role of the theosophical society in india's nationalist movement Uh, is still not fully appreciated mm-hmm. uh, and the theosophical society played a very important role uh, in making uh, for example in the revival of buddhism in what was then ceylon uh, it became a very important instrument uh, for making educated upper caste indians aware of hindu traditions and also uh, its buddhist traditions and of course annie besant uh, you know is one of the great one of the great figures of the indian freedom movement in the pre gandhi era uh, you know uh, you know her peak reaches in 1918 and gandhi becomes of course the supremo in 1920 uh, but the fact of the matter is that you know uh, this was a period uh, when indian thought was being crystallized uh, when india was challenging british rule not politically but on the strength of its cultural legacy on the on the strength of its civilizational legacy and if you read vivekananda for example vivekananda quotes chapter and verse uh, from edwin arnold in all his speeches in america and many of his speeches in england uh, to show that look uh, 
uh, long before you came to India, we had given the world the Buddha. And in fact, the Buddha is seen to be a pre-Christ, Christ-like figure, yeah. you know, and that was the great strength of the Buddha. So I think we hardwired into every Indian Radhika, man or woman, is Buddha. We all carry something of the Buddha in us because we have read about the Buddha in our school textbooks. Uh, you know, we all admire the Buddha. He is, of course, India's greatest export in the last 3,000 years. Uh, you know, of course, my Nepalese friends will say he was, a, he was an export from Nepal. Uh, because they, you know, they're, they're very touchy about it. About. And I've often had arguments with my friends in Nepal saying that, okay, he's a subcontinental figure. Let's agree that he was a subcontinental figure. So he remains uh, the greatest figure, the historical figure. Lord Rama ultimately is a mythological figure. But Buddha is a, is a historical figure. And he remains the single most uh, significant, uh, you know, Sunil Khilnani's a famous book, 50 Incarnations, the first chapter is on Buddha. He remains the first major, perhaps, and undoubtedly, why should I say perhaps, undoubtedly, the most influential uh, Indian, uh, subcontinental, you know, who, uh, who has ever graced the world. So I think the personality of Buddha, and by focusing on the humanity, by focusing on the fact that Buddha was preaching a system of personal ethics, that Buddha was preaching a system of personal morality uh, and not organized dogma, not organized religion. I think Arnold's poem really hit the nail on the head. Uh, although uh, I have to say that uh, when Arnold came to India in 85, 86, uh, and thanks to his visit to Bodh Gaya, he was able to have a real estate struggle over there. It's like the Ayodhya agitation, you yes. know, in Ayodhya. But not so well known. Nobody knows that there was this struggle that happened. Yeah, from 1886 to 1953, or a 70-year period, there was uh, uh, agitation between uh, the Buddhist organizations across Asia, uh, led by Dharmapala, the Sri Lankan Buddhist monk, uh, who wanted total control over the Mahabodhi temple, which was then controlled by the Shaivite Mahans. So I get why you, he, there's a lot of gratitude from the Buddhists, which you have also talked about. It, you know, he goes to various places and he's fettered by various Buddhist cultures yeah, and went, countries. He went to Ceylon, you know, he went to Bodh Gaya, he went to Sarnath, uh, and, you know, he became, he, he became associated with the Buddha. But, you know, to complete the, the Bodh Gaya story, which is fascinating, uh, ultimately the solution was found in 1953, that uh, the control was transferred from a total, total control by the Shaivite priests to 50% control by Hindus and 50% control by the Buddhists, a joint committee. That's a typical Indian solution. Yes, it's a very it's typical. typical <laughs> yes. uh, and uh, when the transfer took place, when the control moved from the Shaivite priests to this management committee for the Mahabodhi temple, uh, verses from the light of Asia uh, were recited you know, in the public function as a mark of tribute uh, to Edwin Arnold and the movement that he had started. I might say that even today, there are many Ambedkarite organizations who want total control over the Mahabodhi temple. And their argument is, if the caste Hindus want total control over the sacred places in Ayodhya, why can't we have Buddhists have total control uh, over the Bodh Gaya Jeff, I just want to come back to the book a bit and uh, I, I wanted to also come back to the poem which triggered off the book. I, you know, when I was reading your book, one thing that really comes across strongly is the number of people who, are, who encountered this book when they were young, including you, I think. You know, we have, you have Gandhi, you have so many of these people who said that, that they were young when they read this book. And there are many who debate the literary merit of this poem. You know, you have, you, you quote uh, Jorge Luis Borges who's saying that he didn't think the poem was that great on literary merit, but he also confesses that he read the book when he was young and he can remember big chunks of it, you know, when he was older. So is there something about the, that concept that, you know, that when very young minds, impressionable minds come across a book like this, a poem like this, which is, has a very strong emotional impact you know, uh, well, devoid, are, regardless of literary merit, I, I'm not trying to judge. I was not surprised to discover 
that uh, the poem had an impact on literary and political personalities. You know, Rudyard Kipling, Leo Tolstoy, Rabindranath Tagore, Elliot, Gandhi, yeah. Vivekananda and Nehru. I was not very surprised, Ambedkar also. Mm -hmm. But what surprised me was that C.V. Raman, you know, India's first Nobel laureate in, in science in 1930, uh, C.V. Raman uh, writes that he was influenced in his youth by three books. One was Helmholtz's book on physics. The second was Euclid's geometry. And the third was Edwin Arnold's Light of Asia. And he talks about the renunciation aspect, as does Gandhi. Gandhi. Both of them were very taken up with this idea of renunciation being such a noble act. Raman gave his speech uh, in, in Stockholm. Uh, you know, he, he alluded to the fact that uh, the Light of Asia had made him uh, uh, more sensitive to the idea of renunciation, sacrifice, uh, compassion, you know, the, the the qualities that are normally associated with the Buddha. He uh, also, I think he also lamented that, uh, you know, India, which had had been given this gift of these ideas, had, had uh, ceased to foster them or remember them. Absolutely. But, and so C.V. Raman came as a big surprise to me. I mean, similarly, like anybody who has done school chemistry will tell you that, you know, the first thing we learn in chemistry is the periodic table of elements. And the inventor of the periodic table was a Russian chemist, the great Russian chemist, Dmitry Mendeleev, uh, you know, for whom the light of Asia was almost uh, sort of, a, you know, the daily reading, a daily ritual for him. Uh, now, within India, uh, if you were to take some of the great social reformers, Radhika, uh, the, the SNDP, the Sri Narayana Guru, uh, you know, the, the great social reformer of Kerala, or you look at Iyothi Thas and uh, Lakshmi Narsu of the erstwhile Madras presidency in what is now Tamil Nadu, uh, you know, the light of Asia became uh, a defining text for them because, you know, they were fighting caste orthodoxy uh, and uh, they saw in the Buddha, uh, a fighter, uh, a man who accepted uh, drinking water from a Shudra. The Shudra boy is reluctant to yeah. give the Buddha yeah. water, yeah. To Siddhartha water. But Siddhartha says, uh, you know, just before he receives enlightenment, what is all this caste? You know, you're a boy, uh, you're a human being. Uh, if you want to give me the water, give me the water, you know, and I will drink it. So this, this was the message. And ultimately, of course, Ambedkar himself, uh, became the most uh, sort of, you know, visible, most powerful and most influential figure in the world of Indian Buddhism. Uh, and this was a book that had... But you talk about uh, Ambedkar's uh, Ambedkar. journey into Buddhism and, and you detailed it quite a bit that whether, whether there's a direct or an indirect influence of this book. I think there was an indirect influence, but there was a direct influence on one of Dr. Ambedkar's gurus, Dharmanand Kosambi, Kosambi. In India's great, uh, greatest scholar of Pali in Buddhism, the father of D.D. Kosambi, the polymath uh, D.D. Kosambi, Dharmanand Kosambi. Uh, incidentally, I must mention to you that you and I and all Indians associate the search for enlightenment of Prince Siddhartha with four uh, with the four but sides. Kosam, but Kosambi doesn't agree with that. He sees, uh, uh, he sees a, a cripple, he sees an old man, he sees a corpse and he sees a monk. Mm -hmm. Neither Kosambi nor Ambedkar buy this argument. Uh, both Kosambi and Ambedkar uh, say that the search for renunciation by Siddhartha was because the two tribes, the two clans were fighting with each other. He tried to mediate. He failed. Uh, he was disgusted with the fact that these tribes were fighting over water uh, and he went in search of you know, renunciation. So that was a completely redoing. Quite a fascinating uh, insight. Uh, yeah. Normally yeah. taught, uh, but this became part of the historiography uh, of Buddha as uh, written by uh, Dharmanand Kosambi, and also which is contained in Ambedkar's posthumous book, The Buddha and His Dhamma, mm -hmm. which was published a few months after he passed away in December of 1956. I, when you talked about Ambedkar and you talked about a lot of other thinkers, uh, what was really interesting was also the, the, the central position that books held in their lives. You know, you, you have snaps of their libraries, you have lists, letters of them talking about books, the lists of their favorite books. These were men who read a lot. Yeah. And it also got me wondering that what happens when, you know, this, the, a, a lot of the power of this idea 
we had now evidence that you know that this was Nehru's list. He went to jail with these books. Uh, he has letters. You have talked about him having letters with Churchill about the book. You know, Gandhi talks about having read this book and recommending it to so many people. And as I was wondering now, in today's world, as, as technology has changed, and a lot of people actually pride themselves on not reading too much, and we have technology which has, uh, I think, facilitated or encouraged brevity. You know, you have Twitter, you have memes, you have posts on Reddit, where information is communicated in a, in a sort of a transient, ephemeral manner. And perhaps people broadcast stuff before they have thought it out. What do you see then as the power of an idea today in, when, when technology is so away from books, as opposed to this life which you have chronicled in such depth, when everybody was reading? Well, it's interesting, you know, it's a different time altogether. Just imagine, Radhika, in early 1955, uh, Winston Churchill, you know, the arch imperialist, you know, many Indians would see him uh, yeah, as a big enemy, you know, he was a racist and um, uh, he was certainly an India phobe. And when he was British Prime Minister, he writes two letters to his Indian counterpart, Jawaharlal Nehru, and he ends the letter by saying, remember, the light of Asia. And I've quoted both those letters uh, you know, which are available in the Nehru archives and the Churchill archives. And it's interesting that in 1955, Churchill in his farewell letters to Nehru is reminding Nehru of the light of Asia. <laughs> I mean, two prime ministers who obviously, you know, they were both bibliophiles, you know, they were both read a lot. But you're right. I mean, you know, this is not the new generation. Today's generation, of course, uh, would, uh, would hardly, I mean, if you were to ask a person in Bombay today, uh, what is the light of Asia? The most popular restaurant yeah. uh, in south of Bombay. Light of Bharat also is there in Shivaji Park in it's Bombay. Called the light of Asia. But uh, yeah, I mean the reading habit. Uh, no, is I, yeah, one is the reading from. habit. I was wondering whether the change in technology will have impacted the quality of an idea or how ideas are diffused and transmitted. So you have, for example, you refer to Ashoka, and we have literally edict set in stone. You know. I mean, that was the most permanent form or the lasting. Well, that was it, digital for its age. It's exactly. And then we have books. And now you have something which is as, as, uh, as I said, transient and ephemeral. So I think people in public life no longer write the letters that Gandhi and Nehru and Tagore and Vivekananda used to write. Uh, you know, uh, they, they never engaged in the world of ideas. They never engaged in the world of books. There are honorable exceptions, of course. Uh, but yes, we have uh, moved on in an, to an era uh, in which a book like The Light of Asia, where it were to be published today, is unlikely to have the type of impact that it had in 1879. The impact that it had both in English and the impact that it had uh, as translation. You yes, know, that, that was really fascinating also, because as you pointed out, his book started with translations of the French from the Sanskrit, from the Chinese, from the Sanskrit. Yes. And yet you have so many thinkers in India who came across it from the translations in Marathi and other Indian languages. So this, you know, there are these loops and worlds in which this book has all the ideas in the book have come and gone from India. It's got translated into every Indian language, uh, Radhika, including Sindhi. Uh, you know, Bengali, Hindi, Malayalam, one can understand, but you know, Sindhi, Odia. Have you read the Kannada version then? Yes, there is a Kannada version. There is a Kannada version. Uh, of course, there are multiple Tamil versions. Uh, and uh, there are there's an Assamese version. Uh, so, you know, it got translated. And interestingly, India's first silent film uh, was made in 1925. It was a joint Indo-German film. Uh, Franz Austin was a director. Himanshu Roy, Rai, uh, you know, Devika Rani's uh, first husband, Himanshu Rai, was the producer. Sita Devi was uh, uh, the main actress, and the name of the film was The Light of Asia. Der uh, Dai Lukt Asian, which was uh, that was what it was called in German. It was released as The Light of Asia in uh, in English in England, uh, and um, of course it got quickly banned in Ceylon and Thailand uh, because of some kissing scenes between Yashodara and Siddhartha, which was not acceptable to the Buddhist clergy, uh, you know, in both these countries. But it was quite a hit in India uh, in, in the late 1920s. It was a hit in England. Well, you have Herman Hesse's Siddhartha and you have the movie Siddhartha, which also created waves back then. Yes, so. Herman, you know, Herman Hesse's Siddhartha uh, was, of course, uh, was a very popular novel. 
uh, it was you know it was a completely different genre yeah uh, it was you know it was a novel it was uh, based on a man's search uh, and herman has um, yeah I, i mean certainly uh, there was uh, herman has did much to popularize uh, the con- the idea of siddhartha but by then people had got used uh, thanks to various books that had been written by different scholars and of course the light of asia uh, which was in my view uh, the single most important work to popularize buddhism i think that's the word you used radhika uh, it uh, edwin uh, arnold was not a pioneering scholar he was uh, not a traditional thinker really speaking we are talking of popularizing you know we are talking of uh, putting into the public domain uh, you know ordinary people reading it buddhist people converting to buddhism after reading the poem uh, in england for example uh, the first conversions in england to buddhism the first conversions to buddhism in america uh, took place on account of of this poem so you know it was not uh, it was not scholarly it was not academic um, uh, but it was it was a work of poetry it was a, you know so so coming back to the poem again and you said you you read it when you were very young Uh, what is your own relationship to this poem and i don't mean from this curiosity which led you to write this book but you read it when you were young do you recall your responses to it are there bits in it that touched you or you can recall I, like or his recalls i i must have read it when i was uh, 15 or 16 which was decades ago uh, and um, it's you know it remained with me you know it remained with me uh, i also read the song celestial uh, mm. i also read uh, edwin arnold's other works the translation into the git govinda and the, and the mahabharata and the hitopadesha and you wrote a book on islam also apart yes. from the work on christ absolutely but mm-hmm. you know the light of asia remain with me as i mentioned to you uh, you know i mean i don't think there is any indian home radhika where where you will not find this mm-hmm. right this is a ubiquitous feature in every indian home uh, i mean you know we may be hindus we may be muslims we may be christians whatever but the buddha is there so this uh, i mean it's somebody has to really understand why buddha has got hardwired into every indian you know and we but you ed- give you give edwin arnold a lot of credit for doing this yes, for bringing him back for bringing him back to, to india in some ways a lot of it has to do with the popularization of the of the life of buddha uh, edwin arnold's book is not about buddhism it's not about buddhist philosophy or buddhist thought it's about the life of buddha and that's why you know i end the book by saying that it's not divinity of buddha that made him such a cult figure it's his humanity uh, you know people were looking for uh, you know f- figures who transcended uh, divisiveness uh, figures who uh, who brought together people of different persuasions different creeds and in today's world perhaps a dalai lama you know uh, fulfills that role uh, but at that point of time in the late 19th century and the early 20th century uh, buddha was a was a raging phenomenon uh, people were getting disillusioned with organized religion uh, and this was the period and you know the discovery of buddha also gave strength to the indian nationalist movement uh, to tell the britishers long before your ancestors were born we yeah, had we had this thing called with we us. had we had produced a buddha so, you know? so your curiosity into edwin arnold when you began writing and you said there was only one biography about him you know back in 57 uh, uh, what what did you find lacking in that biography that I sent you know. searching for new mm-hmm. answers did you find new answers the provocation for this book was the discovery of Churchill's letters to Nehru, you know, which, which said, "Remember the light of Asia." So I was very curious, you know, why Churchill was he referring to the poem, or was he referring to a concept? Well, he was referring to the poem. He was obviously referring to the poem. Uh, otherwise, why would he say, you know, "Remember the light of Asia"? Uh, Churchill, of course, was profoundly influenced by Rudyard Kipling, uh, and you know, and Rudyard Kipling uh, was profoundly influenced by the light of Asia. In fact, I might tell you that um, you know, Churchill, the only reading. Churchill did when he was a young man uh, was in the afternoons when he was in Bangalore. You know, Bangalore's contribution to Churchill. In commercial Street, <laughs> yeah. shop, walking down Commercial Street. Make yes. him a reader of books, yeah. uh, and I contacted uh, one of uh, uh, you know one or two of Churchill's biographers, uh, and they said that the great contribution of Bangalore to Churchill's life 
was that it forced him to read books, which he otherwise would not have read. And one of them, of course, was Rudyard Kipling. Uh, and, and Kipling was, was a great book of Arnold, a great fan of the light of Asia. And uh, Kipling was nominated and got the Nobel Prize. Uh, the person who nominated him for the Nobel Prize in literature, which he got in 1907, uh, was Edwin Arnold for that matter. Uh, when you were started this work on this bi uh, biography, and you had this little poem where, you know, Arnold has this little mocking poem about how uh, life, his, any person who tried to write a biography of him would find it a nightmare. Uh, did you find it? A struggle. Yeah, I found this very, very interesting. And let me just read out these lines. Yes, could you read out uh, that little poem, the little ditty he wrote about? Arnold wrote in 1893, mm -hmm. and this I discovered in his private papers uh, in, in the University of Texas in Austin, which I was able to access in the COVID era through, you know, through the digital archives. And he writes to my biographer. This is a poem he writes, an unpublished poem. Trace me through my snow, track me through my mire. You shall never know half that you desire. Praise me or as birds, deck me or deride. In my wheel of verse, safe from you, I hide. You know, and that's how, I mean, that's sort of. So he was sort of, he was, he was warning you that it's not going to be easy. Yeah. He's an archivist yeah. nightmare, you said. Go search for who I am. Uh, and, you know, it will lead to all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, alleys. And ultimately, Radhika, uh, the book ends by my discovery of Edwin Arnold's great-grandchildren mm -hmm. who live in Bhopal. So that was, uh, in fact, I wanted to ask you about that because you had this throwaway line in the book that uh, there's a lot of Buddha in Conan Doyle's stories, you know. Uh, yeah. And you did a lot of detective panti yourself, did you not? Yeah, both in tracking down... <laughs> I mean, stuff was, and tracking down the grandchildren. It was a mind-blowing experience. Uh, Edwin Arnold had a son called Channing Arnold, uh, you know, who was a bit of a rebel. Uh, and Channing Arnold came to Bhopal in the 1920s uh, and became a tutor uh, to the young princess of the Bhopal princely family. Uh, and he wrote uh, two books in the 1920s, which became textbooks in Indian schools. Uh, one of the book was called the Ramayana, and another book was called the Mahabharata. These were, of course, in English. Now, Channing Arnold married uh, a local Muslim noblewoman uh, and produced two children, Rafiq Arnold uh, uh, and, you know, Grace Arnold. Now, Grace, he was murdered on a property dispute in 1937. That's the, that's the little snippet that got you searching for that. Yeah, that got me searching when I was in the archives, you know, National Archives. I was looking at Edwin Arnold and suddenly I find this, uh, you know, Edwin Arnold's son killed. And then that's, and by the way, I didn't go to the National Archives. All this I got you know, through oh, yeah. digital portal, uh, the portal. <clears throat> and so Channing Arnold's son, Rafiq, uh, stayed in Bhopal. Uh, Channing, Channing Arnold's daughter, Grace, uh, went back to England. Uh, and Rafiq's, uh, you know, children, uh, wonderfully syncretic names. I discovered uh, Edwin Arnold's great-grandson called Mohammed Arnold. Mohammed I think he, he would have been very pleased. There should have been one. There should have been one Gautama between them to make. To there was a Fazia Arnold. There is a Farooq Arnold. So this is what William Dalrymple calls the White Mogul line yeah. of Edwin Arnold. And then of course you have John Arnold, Grace Arnold, uh, Alvin Arnold. What, what is their sense of this this great grandfather of theirs? And do they have a sense of his history? They had some. You know, they had some old uh, old books belonging to. Channing and Arnold, they knew uh, who Edwin Arnold was. They, of course, knew the light of Asia. Certainly, they knew of the light of Asia. And they had some old editions of the light of Asia, which, you know, I was able to get images of. Uh, but uh, it's very interesting, you know, that, you know, the book ends by, uh, you know, this, the, the, the rediscovery of this great Orientalist oh, grandchildren. Yeah. One branch of which uh, is in Australia and Thailand and England. And the other branch is entirely in Bhopal, you know, and that itself uh, is a great story. You know? And I, that also what makes me wonder about, you know, because you have such a human touch to the ending of this book. And when we have Indian history, you know, the way it's taught, it is full of, we have calendars of events, we have uh, measurements of monuments, maybe locations of places, but there's very little of the human touch, you know, we don't, we don't have, uh, I think, sufficient biographies about the actors in our history and 
your last few books i think you've written one book every year in the last 6 years well uh, the last few books have been about people and that what has drawn you now to be a seeker into what makes people tick because a lot of your books about krishna menon you have indira gandhi you have bhagsar radhika you know i i write books where i can find written evidence uh, you know i don't write books based on oral history so no speculative fiction for you i don't write uh, you know i don't write books based on recollections of people reminiscences of people if there is primary archival material available which is contemporary in nature then i will venture to write a biography uh, and whether it was indira gandhi whether it was pn aksar whether it was krishna menon or edwin arnold for that matter and the light of asia uh, you know there's no i mean is, these are narrative biographies Uh, and by definition narrative bi- biographies have to be based on contemporary uh, written archival evidence so that um, i if there is no written evidence i will not write a biography but do you speculate because i was wondering at the end of this book do have you wondered what india would have looked like if gandhi and nehru and ambedkar and all had not read did that bind go, did any what if scenario go through your mind when you were re- doing this work my mind uh, maybe it's an engineering mind because i studied engineering you know it's it's very cut and dry you know uh, you know i so unless there's factual material available i will not even attempt writing a book jaram you're also a politician and you have a sense of what the world should be so you must have had this sense of in what way this country of ours might have looked different if this book that you say had such an impact had not existed well you know uh, yeah i suppose what should be one should work towards it but when one is writing uh, one you know one should be a little more uh, based on evidence for example let me give you an example i have for many years i have been fascinated with the personality of kamaraj one of the greatest chief ministers india has produced in many ways the maker of modern tamil nadu and i have been wanting to write a biography of him and i spoke to some of my tamil historian friends and they said sir don't even attempt it because the only written material you may find about kamraj is his signature on files you know you will not find you know the, the type of material for example that you will find on gandhi or nehru or even krishna menon or ambedkar you know that generation is over so uh, i you know i am very i'm right now for example working on a biography of the indian molecular biologist obaid siddiqui uh, okay. and using that as a as a way of telling the story of how scientific institutions were built by people like nehru baba uh, sarabhai and others uh, and you know and the ncbs the national center for biological sciences was built up by obaid siddiqui you know earlier he had built up the laboratory for molecular biology at afr in in bombay but again there it's the availability of primary material that dictated the choice there's a lot of material available in the archives in bangalore there's a lot of material available in tifr archives and you know in foreign archives But material apart do you think that as a country we are mature enough to have a uh, uh, no holds barred biography of any of our leaders i mean there is always this risk isn't there because we haven't i think had a edwin arnold is in the dim and distant past but anybody very close and i mean by close in the last 70 years do don't you think that we perhaps as a country have not uh, reached that kind of evolution where we can look at them and say this was a man these were his foibles these were his eccentricities but this was his greatness also uh, radhika you know after all we are a, we are an oral culture tradition you know we are not we are not a written culture tradition people like gandhi and nehru and ambedkar these were you know vivekananda were exceptions but you know our tradition has been oral we we have lacked a written tradition so finding written material uh, is is very difficult for a historian or for a scholar in india secondly uh, we end up being too judgmental you know we we tend to be less analytical uh, uh, and we less also objective. we also tend to deify very quickly that's what i said you either deify you either glorify a person or you demonize a person you know there is no which does not make for a good biography uh, uh, practice really there is no buddhist middle path you know there is no buddhist middle path you either glorify a person or you demonize a person and then you sit in judgment or you do psycho history saying that he was beaten up when he was a child uh, you know he grew up uh, with, with his mother ill treating him uh, you know or something else and that had a profound impact on his you know these types of psycho babble you know psycho history 
So, I, you know, as a rule, uh, we, we do not have, you know, the, if I can count uh, uh, on my left hand, the number of great political biographers India has produced. You know, S. Gopal uh, was a, uh, one of the greatest political biographers of the world. Rajmohan Gandhi uh, has been uh, a great political biographer. In our own time and, uh, you know, age, uh, Ram Goha has been a great political biographer. But as you said, we are not a country which believes in documentation. And I think even uh, Sunil Hilani talks about it in his last book that people who there were lots of people he could not write about because of the lack of hard facts about them. Yeah, but people, you know, these are people, whether it's Gopal, whether it's Rajmohan Gandhi, uh, whether it's Ram Goha, uh, you know, these are people who do painstaking archival research. They do cross-checking. Uh, you know, they don't depend on conversations. They don't peddle uh, gossip uh, as facts of history. And if you look at most political biographies in India, Radhika, they don't meet the test of scholarship. You know, they may sell well, you know, uh, there may be chatpata, there may be a lot of masala, so to speak. Uh, but, you know, the type of hard scholarship that is required uh, and the neutrality. See, I have always said that as an author, I may not be neutral, but I have to be objective. You know, I have to put all the facts. All the facts. Right? You know, but this know, is a great pity because I think that through biographies, you end up with a lot of micro perspectives, which map out, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the terrain of a country's context so, with, with so much more detail and personalization than mere calendar of events would. So when I wrote on Indira Gandhi or Haksa or Krishna Menon, uh, certainly, I was not neutral, but I was objective. Of course, in the case of Edwin Arnold, it doesn't matter, you know, because you know the subject is is a completely but, different subject. But even with him, I think I detected a sense of disappointment on his views on Sati, for example, because <laughs> you were surprised that this, such an open-minded man was too open-minded when it came to Sati. One of the things that I've always tried to do in my biographies, which I think biographers must always do, is to put yourself in the context of the times. You can't divorce people from the context of their times. You know, hindsight is the best insight you can have. But, you know, it's very easy, very convenient uh, with the benefit of hindsight to say many things that this should have happened, that should have happened. But, you know, I mean, then you get into the realm of speculation, that speculative history, counterfactual history. But uh, I'm not a professional historian by any means. Uh, you know, I'm neither, academic, I am neither an academic or a scholar, but uh, I believe that one can enrich the world of scholarship through such books, for which material is publicly available. I don't have any special access on account of the fact that I'm a member of parliament or I've been in government. These are all publicly accessible documents in Indian archives and foreign archives. If only Indian scholars get off their backsides uh, and decide to devote a lot of time and energy uh, to research. Unfortunately, most uh, you know, books that get published in this country uh, are not the products uh, of profound or deep research, but they are, you know, some expressions of opinion uh, of the of the author who is writing the book. We now move on to questions from the live audience. Sujit Sinha um, wonders whether the primacy of compassion or love, as differentiated from man-woman love. Uh, which we find in Christianity was an influence of the Buddhist monks who preached in the region. On the contrary, Christianity was profoundly influenced by Buddhism because Buddhism and Buddhist thought in Buddha uh, was a pre-Christ phenomenon, you know, 300 years, 400 years before Christ. So uh, uh, the whole idea of monks, uh, the whole idea of celibacy, uh, all came from the Buddhist Sangha. Uh, and, and the Buddhist uh, holy order. Uh, so Buddha actually had a profound influence. And there is a section in my book uh, where I talked about um, Christian stories uh, derived from the life of the Buddha. Uh, and this is a very little known fact of Christianity, that there are many, many stories of Christianity that are derived from the life of the Buddha that were taken from India, uh, you know, to different parts of the world. Uh, and this particular story uh, Barlam and Josephat, uh, you know, uh, uh, was basically Buddha going west rather than Buddha going east. You know, we normally think that Buddha went only east to Japan, China, Korea, Southeast Asia, but Buddha also went west. Uh, and one of the consequences of Buddha going west 
uh, was this um, fact that uh, Buddha's life became part of certain uh, Christian myths as well. So Christianity, I would argue, uh, has been influenced uh, by Buddhism, not, not the other way around. Raja Ramanathan uh, asks, other than Kosambi and uh, Ambedkar's reference, references to why the Buddha left home, are there any other academic references to the reasons? All, all references that I have seen to the search for enlightenment go back to the four sites. And Dharmanand Kosambi uh, was the first to challenge this view. And Ambedkar took up this view. So I would argue from my reading, uh, you know, from my reading, and as I said, I'm not a scholar of Buddhism or a historian of Buddhism, but to the best of my knowledge, uh, the four sites uh, of Siddhartha uh, is conventional wisdom that was challenged first by Dharmanand Kosambi and later by Ambedkar. And I believe that these are the only two people who really challenged the four sites view. Even the great social reformers of South India, uh, Sri Narayana Guru, uh, Iyoti Thas, Lakshmi Narsu, did not challenge the four sites view. Uh, they, they took the four sites view uh, as the provocation for Buddha, for Siddhartha going out uh, and seeking enlightenment. So the answer to your question is perhaps only Kosambi and Ambedkar. Dharmanand Kosambi and Ambedkar. Uh, Saurav Kartikeyan asks, uh, where does Buddha's teachings and message stand today in Indian society? How impactful are his teachings uh, for today's young generation? And if you can suggest some more titles uh, so that the young can discover the Buddha. But it's one of the great paradoxes of modern day life that some of the most violent societies in the world are societies which profess a belief in Buddhism. Uh, you know, and in this respect, the political abuse of Buddhism is no different from the political abuse of Hinduism, the political abuse of Islam, or the political abuse of Christianity. I mean, look at the countries that, uh, you know, believe uh, that they are Buddhist in nature. Sri Lanka, uh, Myanmar, um, you look at uh, Thailand. These are countries wracked by ethnic conflict. And look at Japan in the 1940s. Uh, when it started, um, you know, uh, the, the process of, uh, you know, taking over other parts of Southeast Asia. Japan called itself the light of Asia. <laughs> and in the name of being the light of Asia, uh, it started uh, conquering other countries, you know, in terms of colonial expansion. So it's one of the great paradoxes of life that uh, this great messenger of peace, compassion, tolerance, understanding, uh, uh, you know, is the patron saint, so to speak of societies uh, which have been wracked by all sorts of violence uh, and all sorts of conflicts. Um, but I think this is where one, one must draw a distinction between, as I said, and I end the book by drawing this distinction between the humanity of Buddha and the divinity of Buddha. Uh, you know, I, you know I'm, not a, I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not a believer in the divinity of Buddha. But I believe in uh, the essential messages of the Buddha, the four noble truths, uh, the, you know, the eight way, uh, the right path, the eightfold path that he laid out, the system of personal ethics and personal morality. I think these are all uh, messages that continue to be relevant. And that explains why the Dalai Lama, for example, remains an iconic figure. Uh, in country after country, and it explains why the Chinese are mortally scared of the Dalai Lama, uh, because the, the, the Dalai Lama's message uh, is it resonates uh, with people cutting across religions, cutting across um, religious denominations. Uh, there are a number of books, uh, you know, which explain uh, Buddha, uh, but I would, if you are interested, I would say. There is a distinction to be made between Buddha and Buddhism. Uh, you know, Buddhism is like any organized religion, organized creed, organized dogma. Uh, and I repeat what I said early in the beginning. The greatness of the Buddha, the uniqueness of the Buddha, the Buddha became the Buddha by not following a Buddha. And that remains the central tenet of Buddha. 
So I think one has to understand Buddha, not necessarily understand uh, Buddhism in the organized sense. But I'll certainly share the references uh, uh, with the person who's asked the question. Jayakrishnan Menon says, uh, in today's Matrabhumi, he read a review of your book and uh, he says that uh, you speak about the translation of the book into Malayalam by uh, Kumaranasan, the poet of Kerala, and also by Nalapad Narayanan Menon. Uh, he wants you to uh, uh, elaborate a little more about this. Well, you know, in the in the early part of the 20th century, sometime between 1910 and 1920, a number of uh, translations into Malayalam took place. Uh, and, um, and the reason why the light of Asia became uh, so uh, attractive was because of this message of caste equality and the rejection of Brahminical orthodoxy. And the greatest social reformer, one of the greatest social reformers that India has ever seen was Sri Narayana Guru, who started the SNDP movement, uh, of which Kumaranasan was one of the great pillars. Uh, and Kumaranasan uh, and, um, and, and Nalapath uh, were the two great Malayalam poets who translated uh, parts of the, not the entire light of Asia, parts of the light of Asia. And it's interesting, Kumaranasan's translation is called Sri Buddha Charitam. Sri Buddha Charitam. Buddha Charitam. It is not about Buddhism. It is about Buddha Charitam. It means the character of the Buddha. So it was. They were not. They were not talking about Buddhism as an alternative to Hinduism, uh, but they were looking at the personality of the Buddha as a revolutionary uh, to confront the social evils of untouchability and caste. And last year, this time, exactly a year ago, uh, I had occasion to speak to the great. Uh, Kerala uh, Malayalam poetess Sugata Kumari, you know, she passed away in December of 2020 out of complications of COVID. Uh, and I asked Sugata Kumari, which are the books that influenced you when you were a child? And she first reaction was Sri Buddha Charitam. Uh, she said, you know, I read Edwin Arnold, but it was Kumaranasan's Sri Buddha Charitam, which in, impacted me and made me uh, conscious and sensitive to environment uh, you know, to the issues of caste hierarchy, uh, to, to compassion, to tolerance, to understanding. Uh, so in the translations in Malayalam were very, very significant. And soon thereafter, uh, followed translations into Tamil uh, and, and Kannada and other languages as well. So in Telugu, it got, uh, it got translated not because of any social agenda. It got translated because... Uh, you know, it was translated by a Brahmin Zamindar, uh, you know, who uh, who wanted to prove his loyalty to Queen Victoria. Uh, so, and what better way of proving his loyalty to Queen Victoria than by translating uh, an iconic work of the Victorian era. So he commissioned this Telugu translation of the light of Asia, uh, which came out in 1902. But that had no social agenda. Uh, but the first book, the first translation uh, see, it was translated first into Bengali, uh, but that was it was because it was a literary work, a cultural work. Uh, then it got translated, as I said, into Marathi. Uh, Marathi also, you know, it was it was a it was a work, a literary work. It got translated into Telugu, but the first translation into an Indian language with a very clear and overt social agenda was in Malayalam. Uh, by uh, Kumaranasan and Nalapath. Um, Varsha Das, um, alluding to the earlier question about uh, Dharmanand Kosambi, uh, what is uh, Mr. Kosambi's argument for rejecting the story of four sites? Oh, the... it's a very elaborate argument. You know, he goes through the Pali texts. Dharmanand Kosambi, of course, was the pioneering scholar of Pali. Uh, and he looked at Pali texts uh, in what was then Ceylon. Uh, and um, uh, he came to the conclusion that the four sites uh, was a romanticization uh, of Siddhartha's search for enlightenment. Uh, and the uncomfortable truth uh, was this fight between the two uh, the tri the tribal wars, the clan wars uh, over control of water uh, and other property rights. It was a you know one could say it's a Marxist argument, but Dharmanand was not a was not a Marxist in, in any sense of the term. Although his son Didi Kosambi uh, was an unrepentant Marxist 
till the very end. Uh, but Dharmanand's reading came out of Pali texts. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, again, uh, if you're interested, I will, I will refer you, I will send you the exact uh, portions of Dharmanand's work, which was then taken up uh, by Ambedkar in his posthumous work, The Buddha and His Dhamma. Uh, so it's a, you know, it's a revisionist view. It's a view that neither Gandhi or Nehru or Tagore or Vivekananda, none of them, you know, ever went in that direction. Uh, it, this was a direction in which uh, only Kosambi and Ambedkar went. But it's, uh, it's an interesting view. I mean, if you ask me, what is my view? Um, well, I would say the four sides view is a, is a romantic view. Probably Dharmanand Kosambi and Ambedkar, were probably, you know, there was something to what they wrote. But these are, you know, these are questions that, you know, have to be settled by scholars. And uh, as I said, Dharmanan's great advantage was that he looked at original Pali texts. Somebody who hasn't uh, told us their name asks, what relevance does the epic poem which, that gained such popularity during the growth of agnosticism uh, and scientific discovery have in, have in today's postmodern world? Well, some of the greatest scientists in the world were great fans of this poem. And I've given you just two examples. Uh, I've given you the example of C.V. Raman in India and Dimitri Medelev, uh, Mendelev uh, in Russia. Uh, and even in England, you know, this, uh, the poem was published at the time of great uh, scientific discovery, only 20 years after uh, Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species uh, and Charles Lyell's work on, ge on you know, geology, uh, which dated the age of the earth. Uh, this was the era of, uh, of sci scientific questioning of biblical texts. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of relevance at that point of time. Uh, and Buddha, uh, you know, uh, incidentally, there are many people who see the roots. Uh, they, there is no contradiction between Buddha uh, and modern science. And in fact, uh, in, in some portions of the book, I've quoted Edwin Arnold's speeches in Japan. Uh, where he explained in the 1890s uh, that uh, Buddha was perfectly um, compatible uh, with modern science. Uh, and there have been many, many, many um, uh, modern scientists. In, uh, you know, I must mention to you the, the, the person who got the Nobel Prize in physics uh, in 1969, uh, one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century was Murray Gell-Mann, uh, who was at Caltech. Uh, and Murray Gell-Mann was the man who discovered, uh, you know, elementary particles. Uh, and he tried to systematize, uh, you know, the whole world of elementary particles. Uh, and he uh, called that systematization the eightfold symmetrical path. Uh, and if you read Murray Gell-Mann, uh, and you can just go to the, on YouTube and, you know, just... Uh, into Murray Gell-Mann and you'll see a lot of his speeches where he talks about, you know, that he was inspired by the life of the Buddha and the eightfold path to look at this eightfold classification of, of elementary particles. So, you know, Buddha is, continues to be a source of fascination. Um, uh, even if Buddhism uh, may not be a religion uh, which is, you know, increasing in terms of adherence, Buddha continues to uh, draw, uh, you know, Christians continue to be Christians and yet be enamored of the Buddha. All Hindus are enamored of the Buddha. Uh, Buddha has been a figure uh, that Muhammad Iqbal uh, wrote in, in his Urdu and Persian poetry. So Buddha appeals to people irrespective of religion. See, one of the great disservices that the British did to India is this concept of religion, you know, this census concept of religion. Uh, you know, India, this religion concept came out of Christianity. There is a holy book. There is a holy person who founded Christianity. Christ founded it. What's your holy book? The holy Bible, uh, you know, so sacred place, sacred book, sacred person, founder. Whereas, you know, religions in the South Asian context have been more liminal, you know, the boundaries have been very fluid. Even in Bodh Gaya, for example, even in Bodh Gaya, the Mahabodhi temple is sacred both to the Hindus and to the Buddhists. 
there are many places in india which are sacred to the jains the buddhists and the hindus you know and even muslims go there uh, so you know this this watertight compartments of what is a religion uh, is the western world's greatest disservice because what it does it categorizes people in, and i think the greatness of indian indic civilization has been the confluence of different thoughts and we've been comfortable we've been comfortable in a world of islam we've been comfortable with the world of christianity we've been comfortable with buddha we are comfortable with vardhamana mahavira after all the concept of ahimsa uh, came to uh, mahatma gandhi non violence came to mahatma gandhi largely because of the jain influence uh, in his family when he was growing up so we've been influenced by everybody Uh, so i think you know we have to be a little careful about using these words religion you know purnima jairaj asks uh, what is the role of philosophies uh, that have been uh, propagated by the buddha the tirthankaras basavanna and the many gurus of the sikh movement um, in the quote on quote uh, hindutva idea of the rss and the bjp manifesto the idea well, you know yeah. it's the it's very interesting uh, Uh, buddha is an icon for the rss uh, buddha is an icon for the hindutva movement uh, buddha is seen to be but buddha is ultimately seen to be an avatar of vishnu uh, remember the dashavatara the ninth avatar is buddha uh, and the first uh, textual reference uh, to the avatar of buddha to the avatar of vishnu as buddha comes in jayadeva's gita govinda which is the 12th century uh the first epigraphic evidence of buddha as a uh, uh, part of the dashavatara comes in mahabalipuram uh, somewhere in the 7th 8th century uh so you know by the 7th or 8th century the brahmins had appropriated buddha you know uh, the brahmanical thought which subsequently became part of the indic civilization is a giant blotting paper when they see a threat they absorb them very quickly now buddha was seen as a threat so buddha was immediately absorbed uh, as uh, as one of the incarnations of vishnu of course by then the decline of buddhism had started in india uh, long before islam came uh, buddhism was on a period of long decline uh, and so this concept uh, the, the hindutva forces uh, love the buddha you know because buddha is after all uh, an incarnation of of vishnu but i have argued in the book that the whole idea of avatar the whole idea of incarnation is itself buddhist and the 10th avatar which we call kalki is actually maitreya which is the future buddha that kalki comes from the future buddha so ultimately while the brahmins may have appropriated buddha in, as a part of the dashavatara buddha had the last laugh because the idea of avatar itself and the idea of kalki itself came from the ideas of buddhist thought and buddhist thinkers lata reddy uh, asked what were edwin arnold's views on both karma and dhyana well you know edwin arnold's great contribution lata was on nirvana because nirvana was misinterpreted uh, and continues to be misinterpreted in a negative sense in fact the christian theologians the christian um, critics of buddha uh, continue to harp on uh, buddha being uh, uh, a negative figure in the world of thought because of the concept of nirvana uh, so it was yeah there was the concept of karma there was the concept of dharma but it was the concept of nirvana uh, which was you know central to buddha uh, and which was interpreted to mean negativism you know nirvana was seen in a negative sense uh, but in chapter 8 of his poem uh, in beautiful poetic language uh, you know he talk uh, edwin arnold talks about nirvana in a very positive sense what does nirvana actually mean uh, you know quietude equanimity and this is what he talks uh, in, in terms of nirvana and in his last few um, he ends by saying have trod and how a thousand thousand crores since then have trod the path which leads whither he went 
unto nirvana where the silence lives so you know it was a completely radical interpretation of the word nirvana the concept of nirvana uh, which was one of the reasons why this book uh, became very popular but of course you know even today when we say uh, oh we is attain nirvana you know we that we think of it in a negative sense but actually even honor interpreted nirvana in a dynamic active sense not in a nihilistic sense you know as something that rejects the world i mean be in the world but don't be of the world i mean that in many ways uh, you know is a summation of of the last few pages in the poem but of course he talks of karma uh, he talks of dharma dharma is very important the sist and what dharma in the poem uh, was personal ethics personal morality a commitment to the four noble truths the eightfold path uh, and of course the path of nirvana itself and that nirvana by the way comes not not by following a guru uh, you know nirvana comes from your own search from your own experimentation so i go back to this paradox of buddha the buddha who became a buddha by not following a buddha uh, lita krishnamurti uh, asks why do indians prefer divinity over humanity <laughs> good question good question i wish we were you know i have always said uh, you know and you know i've got into trouble for saying this uh, india and pakistan are two countries you know we are divided by divinity but we should be united in humanity uh, you know uh, there is a there is a humanity content uh, to south asia in fact uh, buddha is the greatest unifier of south asia you have buddhist uh, relics in sri lanka you have buddhist relics in bangladesh you have buddhist relics in nepal and you have some phenomenal buddhist relics uh, in pakistan troll takshila gandhara these are all you know peshawar excavations of 1909 uh, milestones in the discovery of buddha by the subcontinent so if there is one element who unites south asia uh, which is otherwise divided by gods and goddesses uh, it's this figure of humanity called the buddha why do we depend on divinity and not on humanity that's a very interesting question um humanity enforces choices to us a belief in divinity absolves us of making active choices you know we are dependent on somebody for benediction we are dependent on somebody for patronage uh, and we abdicate our own responsibility to that supreme being buddha didn't talk of a supreme being uh, buddha didn't talk about uh, you know abdicating your sense of responsibility uh so it's a it's a very interesting question but i believe that the future really lies in stressing humanity over divinity we have far too much divinity in india and far too little humanity in our country too much of divinity we are divinity surplus humanity deficit uh Dharen Chadda, I think, referring to uh, an earlier conversation, uh, says Alan Watts would uh, disagree with you. Uh, he says that the the Buddha expected humans to be superhuman angels. On the other hand, he believes that Taoism is a much more reasonable and human philosophy. He wants to know your views on it. You know, I I am not an expert on any ism. Uh, and this book of mine is not about any ism i am not a scholar of any ism uh, and uh, all you know this is this is a debate that i yield to somebody's superior knowledge of taoism uh, and i you know and the way buddhism has been practiced uh, in large parts of our own continent uh, subcontinent uh, you know has made me very very careful Uh, on uh, this hypothesis assumption of tolerance understanding compassion you know uh, look at look at what happened in cambodia look at what happened in sri lanka look at what happened in myanmar so yeah i mean maybe taoism is is superior i mean so be it but um, poems have been written about 
Buddha, not about, you know, Taoism. That's what, that's the reason why I ended up writing this book. Yes, uh, thank you, Rika. Um, I think uh, maybe maybe um, it would be nice. What is, what is your view, Jairam, going by the questions that were just asked, on uh, what we can learn from Buddha as a human, since you said that the poem is about Buddha's humanity and not his divinity. What, think, what, 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 what can we learn as a, as a... I think, Radhika, everybody has to search for the answer himself or herself. You know, so I it's would, an empirical, empirical. Uh, I mean, I would. Really. I mean, I, I would, I would hate to reduce, uh, you know, the Buddhist. Uh, sorry, I would use the word Buddhist. I would hate to reduce Buddha's humanity to a set of, you know, five points, five point, point program, five point agenda. <laughs> you know, I, I can't do that. Uh, one has to read. One has to read. One has to read. Um, you know, uh, the, the the books that came out. Um, you know, for example, Riz Davids. Uh, one of the early books, and this is a question that somebody had asked earlier, and I would recommend, although Riz Davids's book uh, came out in the first decade of the 20th century, it was called Buddhist India. You know, it's interesting. You know, the British had Hindu India, Muslim India, and British India, but Riz Davids actually produced a book called Buddhist India. The lamp is within you. Yeah. Uh, you are your own illuminator, and you have to find uh, your own uh, you know, way, what the Buddha does, in my view, uh, is, and I have not discussed this in the book, because this is not a book on philosophy. You know, it's a, it's a story that I'm narrating. What the Buddha does is uh, put forward a system of personal morality, a system of personal ethics, a set of do's and don'ts, so to speak, in today's language, uh, to follow in the search. But he was a great experimenter. As you know, he gave up many things that he started on. Uh, you know, self-mortification is something that he consciously rejected. Um, and so um, there are many well, things. I, that, yeah. you know, there are many things I, that, think, I think when I was reading your book, and, and I'll just use a couple of points to sum up, is I think what your book did when you talked about the poem is also about the power of an idea, you know, how ideas uh, ebb and flow, they gain and lose currency in as cultures change, as contexts change. But the power of a story, especially when it's about a person struggling uh, with, you know, uh, with, with doubts and looking for a greater understanding of the human condition, the power of a story is what really resonates. And that's why I think, you know, as you said, the poem had such a great impact on all the thinkers that you have described in the book. You know, it's more than anything else. It is the story of a man and his own struggle as he as he was seeking for greater yeah. meaning. So thank you so much, uh, Jairam. It's been really wonderful talking to you. And uh, I think uh, I'm sure the audience has learned a lot, both about Light of Asia, which is, which is this uh, evocative and far-reaching impact of this evocative poem, and also about this really interesting man, Edwin Arnold, who has had this impact on us and whom we would not have known about if you had not done this phenomenally in-depth biography. So thank you so much. Thank you, Radhika. It was a delight talking to you. And I wish uh, some people would actually read the book because, uh, you know, you will get a sense of the times, the 19th century, the 20th century, the debates that took place, uh, and how a whole generation of Indians uh, used the rediscovery of Buddha, uh, you know, to assert uh, uh, in their position vis-a-vis -vis the colonial rulers. So it's, it's a very interesting story, you know. Thank you for hanging in there and listening to the full conversation. If you liked what you heard, do share it with friends and family. You can also leave us a review or rating on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. The crew behind this podcast is Gaurav Krishna on sound supervision and production with support from S. Saranaraj and Rahu Tenkaila. Episode artwork and design is by Chandni Venkataraman. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. This is Lekha Naidu, signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.